However, once we recall the context of chapter 8, right, when Paul was emphatic about the inseparable love between God and anyone who has put their faith in Jesus, that appearance should disappear. Rather, it becomes an anguish or lament, as in how Paul's heart ached for his Jewish people because many of them had not put their faith in Jesus despite the special history they shared. Now, on your own, do read chapter 8, verses 28 to 39 again, right before verses, uh, chapter 9, 1 to 5, and you should get Paul's real sentiment fairly quickly. As a side note, though, this does highlight the importance of context. It is easy to misinterpret scripture without context, and this is a clear example. Coming back to Paul's anguish, were the first century Jews the only people who squandered their spiritual inheritance, so to speak? Or are there others? Let's have a one-minute overview of uh, church history and see for ourselves. Right? Um, after Christ, the church grew in Palestine despite persecution. When expulsion came, she scattered across Asia and Europe. When the Romans adopted Christ, she grew in Europe, but also got corrupted. As the church corrupted through the Dark Ages, she grew in Holland and Ireland. Right? After the Reformation of the 16th century, she grew in England. And in the next two centuries, she reached the New World, now the English-speaking world. After World War II, right, the church became more global as it goes into decline in the English-speaking world. And today, the fastest growing church is in China, where persecution continues. Now, what I've just outlined is very broad, even coarse. You should read more on your own if you're interested. What is clear is one thing. No nations or people groups hold on to Jesus for very long. God never ceases to bring his people in, but before long, their children or grandchildren would abandon God yet again. In short, our ancestors, us, and our children all have a rebellious nature, and but for the grace of Jesus, everyone would have abandoned God. This is an important lesson in itself and also a crucial context for the next section. But before moving on, let's draw an application for verses 1 to 5. If it is an undeniable fact that every generation from Adam until the end of time is rebellious, what are we to do? If every generation of humankind is rebellious, what are we to do? And before answering that, let's ask something even more basic. When I said, what are we to do, what do we mean by we? Clearly, I'm not asking about your name or personal history, but in relation to our role in our generation. As the very brief history highlighted, with every rebellious generation, there are those whom God would keep for himself, from the early church till now. So if we have put our faith in Jesus, we are the ones God is keeping for this rebellious generation. That's who we are. God doesn't always tell us how many he would keep, sometimes more, other times less, but the rebellious would always outnumber us. That much is for sure. Regardless, if we are the group whom God has kept for himself, then our application would surely be to ask God, what is he keeping me for? What is he keeping us for? And how could I serve him amongst my rebellious generation? How could I serve God among my rebellious generation? Now, if we have never asked God that, do start today. Besides extending us his grace, God has a purpose for choosing us, and we would do well to know what that is. Moving on, verses 6 to 18 reads, it is not as though God's word has failed, for not who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, 
It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's promise, purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, as Paul repeated how some Jews or Israelis rebelled, he also covered 1,500 years of Israel's history. He went to the beginning and showed how God chose Isaac from Abraham, and likewise, how he chose Jacob from Isaac. Now, the story of Isaac and Jacob was as well known to the recipients then as it is to us now, right? And the context is crucial to the point. So let's revisit that very quickly. Abraham was childless for a long time. And around his 80s, God promised him a son. He got impatient and fathered Ishmael when he was 86. But God said Ishmael wasn't the promised one. Isaac, whom Abraham would eventually fathered, came 13 years later. Isaac married at 40 and for years was childless. Rebecca did not conceive until 20 years later when the twins were born. So coming back to the text, the point about Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob is that all, all four of them, were considered miraculous conceptions. The work of God is not as if someone else did the hard work of making these four only for God to come along and says, I like you too, but I don't like you too. God made all four of them. No one else did. Right? No one else did. God didn't just come along and pick two out of four. God made all four of them, and yet he allowed Ishmael and Esau to rebel. Statements like, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, is potentially disturbing. And some of us are rather upset by it, despite knowing that God said it. Now, before I go on with the passage, let me share the good news up front. If you do belong to the group that finds the Jacob Esau case disturbing, and I tell you, as a kid, I, 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 for a long, long time, I found it very disturbing. We are normal, we are normal, and there is nothing unchristian about it. So be at peace, all right? Be at peace. That's the good news. God said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I mean, that's rather unruly of God, isn't it? Doing whatever he pleases, you know, blessing some and judging others. Now, as I said earlier, we have to bear in mind that chapter 9 is not the first time this subject comes up. Paul had been illustrating the rebelliousness of humans since chapter 1. And likewise, argued for faith as the only form of redemption since chapter 3. So chapter 9 is just an extension of that argument rather than something new. However, it is the first place where the idea of God's selection or election appears. So we should address that now. And just for the sake of repetition... Let's recall that Paul had already shown how everyone has rebelled and therefore fallen short of God's standard. That's clear. For the Jews then, the remaining question would have been twofolded. One, why wasn't it enough to be a Jew? 
And two, why would God choose some Jews and not others? Right? Paul addressed the Jewish questions between chapters 4 to 6. Now, as for the non-Jews, we are left with the one common question. Why some, but not others? Why some, but not others? Now, recalling that at least among the original educated readers, whether Jews or Gentiles, right, having some classical training in Roman law and Greek philosophy was common. So what Paul did here is perhaps not as mind-boggling as then as it is to us now, which might both explain his language and his emphasis. Let me elaborate. All right, Roman law, Greek philosophy. Legally speaking, legally speaking, God could and set some rules for salvation. Lead a sinless life and we are saved. Right, simple. And well understood then and now. Now, not surprisingly, other than Jesus, no one has ever managed that. That's the Roman law, the legal side of it. On the philosophical side, on the logic, right, either some earns their salvation or God gives it to them. Right? Either, God, some, either you earn it or God gives it. There is no third way, I mean, logically. And since no one has earned it, anyone who is saved would have to receive it as a gift. Right? Again, it is simple and well understood then and now. Then why do we have an issue to the extent that Paul had to write? Now, we have already exhausted every possibility and agree that God giving salvation is the only way for humans to be saved. So the issue isn't how it is done, but for whom it is done. The issue is not how it is done. That's straightforward enough. But for whom it is done. So let's look at that a little deeper. If God has to give salvation as a gift, then either he gives it to no one, everyone, or someone. No one, everyone, or someone. Right? There shouldn't be any dispute there. The no one case we have already covered. Legally, God could have done that. He could have given it to no one. The everyone case sounds appealing. God is love, right? So why wouldn't he give salvation to everyone? This is one problem. If God has to give it to everyone, it's no longer a gift, but an obligation. For God to be under obligation, there would either have to be something higher to oblige him, or he obliges himself. Since no, nothing is higher than God, and he hasn't obliged himself, right? he doesn't have to save everyone either. Right? If he gives it to everyone, it's an obligation. So either someone obliges him, which, but no one is higher than God. No one can oblige God. And God has chosen not to oblige himself. Right. Which only leaves the third option. God giving salvation to whomever he wants. He is God. It is his salvation. And he has decided to give it this way. So let me revisit slowly. And I'm sure you get the reasoning. God could have given salvation to no one. He chose not to do this. For God to give it to everyone, something higher would have to oblige God or he obliges himself. No one is higher than God, and he chose not to oblige himself. So God choosing whomever he wants is not a case of God being unruly. Quite the opposite. It is the only legal and logical choice. Legally or logically, there is nothing disputable about God choosing to save whomever he wants. It is a watertight case. Yet, if it is so watertight, why were people upset about it 2,000 years ago? And likewise, why are people upset about it today? For sure, they are not upset with the reasoning. Anyone who is patient enough to go through it has to agree that it is watertight. However, sound reason is only part of how we work.
There are other parts working in parallel. Besides our biblical understanding, we are also led by our personal feelings, sense of justice, position on different matters, not to mention selfish desires. And more often than not, we will apply them to our understanding of the Bible. And if the Bible doesn't agree with us, we tend to get upset, usually for a very long time, sometimes till the day we die. In modern talk, we say that when the biblical view clashes with our world view, our world view tends to prevail. It's part of our human nature. And the clashes are frustrating experience because on the one hand, we genuinely disagree. And on the other hand, we feel awkward about openly disagreeing with God. And these clashes do tear some of us apart inwardly. So we tend to bury them deep inside, taking the strategy of hide, while others walk away from God, taking the strategy of flight. Now we know that neither works, but sometimes we can't help ourselves but do so. Now is there a resolution to this besides hiding or flighting? We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's read verses 29, 19 to 29 first. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out the same lump of clay, some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepare for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved ones who is not my loved one. And in every place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Verses 19 to 26 is about the principle of election worked out in the Old Testament. On the one hand, God uses both the faithful and the rebellious to build his history. And on the other hand, he holds everyone responsible for their deeds. In brief, it's like summing up all the cases as in millions of people over hundreds of years using the same principle. As people act in rebellion, God judges whether it is individuals or nations. And as people act in faith, God blesses whether it's individuals or nations. So if God doesn't have a different approach to us as he has to history, all that's left to explain is how amongst all the rebellious is God able to choose some to be faithful. If God doesn't have a different approach to us as he has to history, how does it explain that he chose us amongst the rebellious to be his faithful ones? Which verse 27 to 29 explains. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the numbers of the Israelites be like the sand by the sea, only the remnants will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah had said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. It is easy to get caught up in the cries of Isaiah and focus entirely on his history. Now, do read Isaiah 10 for a better understanding. But the point here is not about Isaiah or the Assyrian invasion, but how God saves. God saves through faith. And since Paul has already argued that faith isn't something we have within, it means that God saves through giving those whom he choose a measure of his faith. Faith, in other words, 
is what God gives us in order to save us. And yes, he only gives it to some, as the previous verses demonstrated. Now, if we allow our minds to wander, it is tempting to go back to square one and ask why some and not all, yet again, right? But since Paul had already dealt with that, I won't repeat. Rather, I want to take a look at why we like to ask such questions and what that makes us. In short, why do we get upset with God's election even in the face of sound reason, even knowing that faith is a gift? Now, I for one, I for one, wished everyone was saved for two reasons, for two reasons. And no, having love for humankind is not one of them, all right? I have two reasons. One, if everyone was saved, I wouldn't have those awkward moments of having to explain the principle of election to others. Now, I don't like that. And two, if everyone was saved, I wouldn't have to evangelize others. You know, I could go barbecue, right? Now, these are not particularly noble reasons. I agree, but guess what? They are actually no worse than those who object to election out of love for humankind. Wanting to go barbecue is not very noble, but is no worse than objecting to election out of love for humankind. Because either way, it is in clear contrast to what God teaches. And what do we call people who justify themselves over what is in contrast to what God teaches? We saw that in Romans 2, right? We call them hypocrites. Or to be more specific, I am that hypocrite. Now, you might think that I'm adding insult to injury. First, I hailed election as the only reasonable approach, and now I call those who object hypocrites. Well, before the temperature of the message gets any higher, let's get to the good news I promised earlier. To do that, we need verses 30 to 33. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursue the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. If we are caught up in the Jews-Gentiles debate, we would miss the point. The passage never said anyone was more faithful than the other. In fact, other than highlighting that Gentiles can be saved, this section isn't about Jews or Gentiles at all. This section is about the stone that brought that salvation. And what stone is that? The original passage comes from Isaiah 8.14, and Jesus identified himself as this stone back in Matthew 21.44. Reading the passage reveals the heart of God in the first person. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. In other words, God's faith is in the rock or in Jesus. This isn't so hard to fathom. Why wouldn't God have faith in Jesus? Who is, the one from, who is the one with him from eternity past to eternity future? What is rather unfathomable, though, is God, what God does with this faith. Aside from placing his faith in Jesus, God is using that same faith as a form of a gift, a gift for those whom he has elected to be his. Can we pause and think about this for a minute? God uses the faith that he has for Jesus as a form of a gift to give to those whom he has elected. The faith that God has in Christ, right, he gives to some. And who are those whom God gives to? 
the good, the kind, the upright? No. God gives his gift of faith, which only Jesus deserves, to those who are in fact very upset with the idea of getting that gift. So that faith could help them overcome, right, overcome, only to remain upset afterwards. God gives his gift of faith to hypocrites like me, knowing up front that after the gift, after he had given it, after my irrevocable salvation, I would remain a hypocrite. Right? This, there's an English saying, right? Don't spit in the hands that feeds you. Sadly, when it comes to the gift of faith, I spit right back in God's hand. So either he is mad or his love is unfathomable. Can we imagine his love? Coming back to the idea of election for the final time, we now realize it's not necessarily the idea we don't understand. Paul has repeatedly demonstrated that the idea is straightforward enough. What we do not understand is why God would part with something as precious as his faith in Jesus for some hypocrite like me. It is the love that we don't understand, not the election. So the good news, in a nutshell, is that we, even though saved, remains upset with election, not because we have some devilish remnants inside of us. Right? We're clean by the blood of Christ. But only because the love behind our election is unimaginable. It's unimaginable. So I hope that with this understanding, we no longer use the phrase unimaginable love as a figure of speech, but as a real and genuine appreciation of what God has done. And occasionally, occasionally, when we do get upset, we can recall this unimaginable gift of faith and find peace, not to mention gratefulness for what God has done. Sure, we'll still get upset because we are hypocrites. But now we know that we are hypocrites whom God finds worthy of his gift of faith. And if we remain upset about election, then there's one more thing we can do. There's one more thing we can do. You see, although the idea of election is potentially disturbing, we don't actually know who is elected and who isn't. Not until Jesus returns anyway. So rather than whining inside about, you know, why her, you know, why not him, we could actually go out and test to see for ourselves. As we go out and share Jesus, we will see election at work. Indeed, we won't get to see everyone saved, but if we are consistent, we will see some or even many elected, and that has to be encouraging. So there we have chapter 9. Paul began with his anguish over Israel, especially their rejection of Jesus. He then went on to address those who were upset 2,000 years ago about election. And in demonstrating the principle, Paul highlighted that the faith we exercise in response is in fact a gift from God. This faith is not rooted in us, but in Jesus. And how we became a part of God's faith in Christ is simply unfathomable. I hope that this lengthy chapter has given us some room for reflection on how we became what we are today. We truly are the work of God, starting with his gift of faith. May this faith, this gift, motivate us to test the idea of election now more than ever. Not because we're upset or whining, but because we want to find out just how many God has elected. Let's go find out together. God bless.